to be sharing the stage with Ken Bissler from Woods Hole, uh, certainly one of the world's premier oceanographic institutions, and, and Ken's just doing a fantastic job uh, setting up these surveillance programs. Really the only person who's doing it, and, and I really applaud his efforts. I really do. Well, so tonight, uh, my job is to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in Chernobyl and, um, since about 2000 in Fukushima more recently, uh, two huge events. And, uh, you know, up until a few years ago, I used to get the question all the time, why are you working in Chernobyl? Why are you bothering to study the effects of the Chernobyl disaster? And the reason people were asking me this is because everybody thought it was a unique event. It was unique to the former Soviet Union. It was unique to their management style, their engineering. It could never happen again, right? And, and of course, Fukushima proved that that, that isn't the case. And uh, in fact, uh, if you really want to know why we should be doing a lot more research in this area, you really only have to look very, very superficially at the history of nuclear power. Uh, and, uh, you know, essentially, there have been about uh, 600 reactors, plus or minus, since the beginning of time, and currently about 430 around the world in 31 countries, about 100 here in the US, plus or minus. We've got a bunch of new ones under construction around the world. There's four new reactors being built within 60 miles of my house in South Carolina right now. I'm not kidding you. And so, you know, nuclear is not going away. No matter what you think about nuclear power, it's, it's here for a little while longer, at least. Uh, at least in some parts of the world. Uh, so anyway, but in this time, there have been three major accidents at the commercial nuclear power plants. Uh, that's a fairly high frequency, uh, really, when you think about it. And there's been uh, plenty more smaller incidents and, and accidents. And given that most nuclear power plants, most of them are getting older, and many of them ending the, nearing the end of their useful lifespan, we we're expecting to see more accidents. In fact, there was a recent study published or promoted by MIT uh, not too long ago uh, that suggested that we will see another Chernobyl-scale nuclear accident by the year 2050, uh, and we're likely to see a, a, a Three Mile Island-scale event within the next 10 years, uh, based on a much larger data set than had been put together prior to uh, this past year. Uh, frequencies of accidents and engineering analyses. So, so we need to know more. We need to know what the consequences of, of accidents might be. Uh, here is a little map showing all of the current nuclear power plants in the U.S. Most of them tend to be up here. Look, look where I live. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's certainly, we're, we're a nuclear state. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's clear that, that nuclear is here for a little bit longer. Uh, most of these power plants, of course, have huge stockpiles of spent fuel, uh, and, and that's another, another issue. Another reason for understanding the effects of radioactivity in the environment is the fact that, and I didn't know this until five years ago, really, when I got involved in these National Academy panels, every single nuclear power plant, by design, releases literally tons of nuclear effluent every year. Of course they do. That, that, that's, that's how we generate electricity. We're using fission, <laughs> and one, the product of fission are these radioactive daughters that are, have to be dealt with. And most of them are dribbled out into the water or into the air. And of course, as we all know, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? So as long as we can dilute the effluent below these regulatory limits that are rather arbitrarily set, uh, then, uh, then there's no problem. We're, we're, well, at least for the power plant companies, they're operating legally if they can do that. But anyway, every nuclear power plant releases lots and lots of radioactivity, but for the, for the most part, we have little knowledge of the environmental impacts of these effluents. Now, of course, we also discovered recently that every, <laughs> most of the nuclear power plants out there have illegal releases as well, releases that, you know, just, by accident, of course. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we started to pay attention when uh, it was noticed that the Vermont Yankee plant uh, was leaking tritium off-site. 
Uh, and at the time, I was on a National Academy panel that, that where, where they were asking, so what is the impact of leaking tritium? And we sat, we got all together for a couple of days and tried to figure this out and realized that there was no, there was insufficient scientific data, scientific data to really answer the question for Congress. They, we, we really had no idea. We didn't think it was good. We didn't think it was a huge problem at this point because for the most part, the nuclear power plants were only leaking on site. They weren't, for most of them, were not leaking it too far beyond the boundaries of the actual power plant. But, but in truth, we really didn't know. And, and that was kind of a wake up call for a lot of people. But still, to this day, there's not a lot of research going on with respect to radiation or tritium leaks. But we are learning a little bit more. Uh, and it, it, every day as people put things together. Uh, there was a recent meta-analysis. This is, this is the kind of study where you take a bunch of different studies and put them together and statistically analyze the combined data set. And when you do this for studies done in Europe primarily, epidemiological studies, what we've discovered is that if you are a pregnant woman living within three miles of a nuclear power plant, you have about a 100% increase a doubling increase of the probability of your child getting leukemia. Now, that sounds terrible in one way. It certainly is terrible if your child has leukemia, uh, if you've won the negative lottery, as it were. Luckily, childhood leukemia is a very, very rare disease, so, so the, the absolute frequencies of this disease are, are quite low. But again, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a wonderful thing if you're the victim of, of this kind of contaminant. We need to know more. Uh, we had this anniversary this, this last month of the bombs being dropped on Japan. Uh, and most of what we know about the effects of radiation in the environment actually come from the studies of the atomic bomb survivors. Uh, unfortunately, those studies didn't really start until five, six, seven years after the disaster, so we missed a lot of information, or the, the bombs being dropped, so we missed a lot of information from that. But we have learned a lot. But we didn't actually study the effects on the environment, per se, following the atomic bombs. Uh, we have studied the effects on people, but we haven't looked at, at, at the animal populations particularly. So another reason, and especially given, as Ken mentioned earlier, there have been <laughs> just an enormous, I, I, again, I had no idea until a few years ago, uh, we were, we were just going crazy back in the 50s and 60s testing atomic bombs. There were 1,193 atmospheric tests conducted around the world. It's, I think about 400 of them by the US, maybe a few more than that. Uh, in total 2,700 uh, atomic bomb tests. They released, as Ken showed earlier, enormous quantities of radioactivity that still linger at relatively high levels in some parts of the world where the testing was conducted, like the Marshall Islands, parts of the Sahara where the French were testing bombs, uh, and elsewhere uh, that are, it, and, but again, nobody has studied the impacts on the biota in the area. So another reason for doing it. You all live pretty close to Hanford, I think. <laughs> so I'm sure you're aware of uh, the goings on, uh, the states north of you. Uh, the Hanford site, like the Savannah River site, was a place where they, where they, they were generating, making the, the, the plutonium uh, necessary for our bombs. And, and, and in the course of generating the plutonium, they generated a huge amount of waste, uh, much of which was put into storage tanks, which are now leaking into the, into the surrounding area. Uh, into the river and, and causing, uh, potentially causing some serious environmental consequences. We're having to spend an enormous amount of money to deal with it, but we don't, again, we know very little about the environmental consequences uh, of, of this leak, uh, leaking. Maybe it's not a problem. <laughs> right? Maybe it's not a problem. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what we've been told. Uh, many of the models suggest that maybe it's not a problem. Uh, and uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we decided, my research team, just by, just completely by accident, I started off as an evolutionary biologist. I'm still an evolutionary biologist. Uh, and, and my motivation and interest in this topic is, is, is result from an interest in evolutionary biology, how are natural populations changing, adapting in response to this novel stressor. I used to work on climate change, now I work on <laughs> radiation. Uh, 
But uh, so we started working in Chernobyl uh, about 15 years ago. Here's a map of the Chernobyl disaster impacts. Again, uh, 200,000 square kilometers significantly impacted with radiation. Most people know about the stuff in Ukraine and Belarus and parts of Russia. Most people don't realize that large swaths of Scandinavia and Central Europe were also uh, significantly contaminated. Here's a map, similar map for terrestrial Japan. Uh, much, much smaller event from a terrestrial standpoint in terms of land mass contaminated. Uh, the Fukushima disaster is on the order of a tenth or less of the Chernobyl disaster. The Chernobyl disaster was just huge in terms of terrestrial impacts. Of course, as you heard earlier, enormous quantities of materials released from uh, Fukushima uh, into the ocean. Uh, their impacts, their biological impacts, largely unknown at this point. So why hasn't there, why hasn't there been more investment in basic research associated with this, these kinds of events? I would argue that in part it's because uh, the attitudes that have been uh, presented by agencies, intergovernmental agencies in charge of promoting the peaceful use of atomic energy, right? Uh, for instance, the, the IEAE, who suggested in their report from 10 years ago that we had nothing to worry about. In fact, you've probably seen the TV shows that have suggested that the Chernobyl zone is thriving, the animals are doing great because there's a fence and there's no people, and so and the effects of people are bigger than the effects of radiation. But there were no data presented to support that. There were no scientific studies to support that. And, and so, I don't know. Uh, this report from the International Atomic Energy Agency from the Director General just came out this week uh, relating to Fukushima. And it's largely based on the UNSCAR report that came out last year. It's a complete whitewash. They have completely have suggested, they have not reviewed the literature is what I'm saying. They have not commissioned any scientific research. They have not paid attention to the, the scientific research that has uh, been generated in the last 10 years from Chernobyl and the last four years from Fukushima. No rigorous empirical scientific data. Uh, and, and, and they just ignored it. So anyway, um, so in a few years ago, 2000, uh, just, just out of casual curiosity, a colleague of mine, Anders Mahler, uh, who uh, is a very uh, prominent uh, bio biologist. Uh, we decided to work together on this project, uh, visit Chernobyl, and kind of as a sideline, start looking at some of the birds in Chernobyl and see what was going on with them. We thought it would be a novel, uh, new, creative approach to studying evolutionary processes. Uh, we haven't, uh, and, and of course, that's been, been very interesting. We started working together there in July of 2011, so a few months after the disaster in Fukushima. We're mostly interested in, as the physicists say, <laughs> we're the bird and bunny guys. You know, we're, we're interested in birds and bunnies. And uh, yeah, it's kind of derogatory, I know. Uh, but uh, but that, that's, it is true. We've been interested in, in basically the, the biological endpoints. Uh, and we've also been interested in the children, more or less. Made a whole bunch of visits to, to Chernobyl and Fukushima over the years and published. We're, we're over 80 papers now. Uh, and one thing I did want to mention uh, before I get into some of the, the, the negative things I'm going to show you uh, is that you know, we, we consider ourselves to be independent scientists. We're not anti-nuclear activists uh, at all. Uh, we're simply uh, scientists looking, we're in, in looking to find new, new things to see. And, and as scientists, the work that we do is driven by simple hypotheses and questions. And, and you know, very, very simple logic, straightforward logic is what governs what we do. The first question is simply, are the doses that we see in these areas high enough to cause genetic damage, mutations to the organisms? Pretty simple. Uh, if, if they don't, if we don't see any evidence of genetic damage, then, then we don't have to look any further. We don't need to be concerned. Right? Pretty simple. But if we do see genetic damage, it's, that's not enough by itself. Certainly a good hint, but it's not enough. And so the next question is, are there consequences to the shape and size, performance of the organisms as a result of the genetic damage? Are there fitness consequences? Is there any evidence of adaptation? Are there effects 
leading to population changes in terms of abundances and diversity? And finally, are there ecosystem functioning consequences to that? And that's been the driving force of what we're doing. So what have we found? And I don't have enough time to really go into any detail. I'm going to zip through, hit the highlights. Uh, if any of you are interested, uh, I've left a couple of sheets in the back that have a list of some of our publications. Our website has links to most of our papers. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to go there. And of course, you, you're welcome to ask me any questions you'd like. Right, first thing, start with the mutation stuff, the genetic damage stuff. So we've done all sorts of studies looking for genetic damage in a whole bunch of different ways and a whole bunch of different critters. Uh, and other people have as well. Uh, this year, we, we, we published a paper which basically was a, was a meta-analysis. It's one of these analyses of analyses, uh, basically where we take data from all different sources, put it together and analyze it in a combined data set. Uh, it gives us a lot more power to look at patterns. And, and the basic finding was that <laughs> radiation from Chernobyl causes mutations. Big surprise. Uh, we, the, 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 it, was, it was overwhelming. The size of the effect due to Chernobyl radiation uh, was, was extremely large. And this is just, a, again, a plot, a frequency plot, uh, showing the, uh, the, in, the, the effect sizes for all of these different studies. Each one of these lines is a different study uh, in, in sort of radiation versus non-radiation. We had some fairly strict constraints on what would be included. The overwhelming conclusion, and, and it's no big surprise, radiation causes genetic damage in Chernobyl. So what are the consequences? Does it matter? Maybe, you know, we all have mutations. We all accumulate mutations with every cell division. And in fact, our cells are working as hard as they can to repair the genetic damage that occurs as a normal part of physiology. Uh, 50, I th I, the, the, one of my friend's colleagues told me that uh, with every cell division, there are 50 breaks in the chromosomes that have to be repaired. So radiation is just adding to that. But, so maybe there aren't any visible consequences of the added mutational load. Well, there are. Lots and lots. The first thing we noticed, because it was so easy to see, was the fact that many of the birds were showing what we call partial albinism. Uh, there are other words for this, other terms for it. Basically, uh, it's, 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 it's some of the cells responsible for pigments are killed as a consequence of the radiation, direct or indirect effects. And, and this leads to patches of white feathers. Here's a normal barn swallow. Here's one with a big white patch under its chin. This male, it's probably not as affecting his ability to eat or to survive, but it probably is affecting his ability to attract a mate. So he ain't getting any. <laughs> So his fitness ain't too high. But uh, anyway, it is a marker for the radiation exposure. We, we, we don't see these kinds of patches of white feathers anywhere else around the world. I'm going to skip the actual data. You'll have to trust me. It's real. Uh, what's really interesting is that two years ago, we started finding birds in Fukushima with patches of white feathers as well. And uh, again, they're, they're the frequencies are increasing. It's related to the radiation exposure to the area. Uh, so it seems to be real. <laughs> I apologize for showing you a horse, a cow's ass, but you know, <laughs> here it is. Uh, with white spots, partial, they first started noticing these white spots on these cows uh, shortly after the disaster. I don't think they're very common. Maybe we have some ranchers in the audience. Anybody seen white, white patches of fur on their cows? doesn't happen very often. We, we developed a method where we could actually get fresh male genetic material from these birds without hurting them. And, uh, and this is important because it's a proxy for genetic damage. And, and of course, males without good viable sperm have very low fitness as well. And what we learned was that the males that suffered from High radiation and high oxidative stress had very, very poorly performing sperm. Um, we continued this work and noticed that in nine out of ten species that we looked at this in great detail, the Chernobyl birds had highly, much higher frequencies of deformed sperm. And a deformed sperm is not a very useful sperm. Um, and so, again, uh, very strong indications of 
negative consequences. This one, this one was even more interesting. We, we, we realized when we started catching birds in the most contaminated areas that the, in some of these really hotter areas, 39% in this year of the male birds were completely sterile. They had no sperm or just a few dead sperm. So clearly not a good thing. Not surprising, right? If you, if you read the medical literature, uh, you, you would know that, uh, you know, those folks, uh, males undergoing radiation therapy for cancer, prostate cancer, for instance, uh, are, and, and if they're considering uh, re reproductive activity later, uh, they're, they are told to bank their sperm before the radiation therapy because there's a very high chance of either temporary or permanent sterility following that. Uh, and so we weren't totally surprised to find this, but, but again, nobody had, had documented this. But it's not just white feathers and sperm, also lots of cases of tumors and other kinds of strange developmental abnormalities. Uh, here's a nice uh, bird with a really nice big thing. Again, fairly relatively high frequencies of these sorts of aberrations. Um, again, highly statistically significant dose response relationship. The more radioactive, the more likely you are to observe these kinds of uh, abnormalities. And there's the data. So I think just about everything I'm talking about today has been published, is, is in, a, in a paper that you can go to if you're at all interested. One of the first things that was noticed from the atomic bomb survivors was that many people were getting cataracts in their eyes, and even children. And, 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 and we came to realize after that that, the, that the, t the cells of the lens in the eye are particularly sensitive to the effects of ionizing radiation. And, and so we uh, decided to see what was happening in Chernobyl birds. And, and when we started looking at this, much to our surprise, uh, it was very, very obvious. The birds from the more contaminated areas uh, are much more likely to show uh, a, a cataract in their eyes. We started looking at the rodents in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. And, and again, the rodents uh, were showing much higher frequencies of cataracts in the more radioactive areas. Interestingly enough, this is the first data set, uh, we, we've since added more females were much more likely to show a response to the radiation than were the males in these rodents. We think this may have to do with the fact that these are in that these, this is the reproductive season for the rodents, and the females are, are suffering from higher levels of oxidative stress than males, and this may be interacting with the radiation to lead to higher incidences of ca uh, cataracts. We don't know for sure. It's a hypothesis. Another thing that was first noticed in atomic bomb survivors, actually, it was, it was noticed prior to this, uh, for in, in women, pregnant women who were treated with radium therapy and x-ray therapy in the, in the, in the 20s, uh, 1920s, when they started using x-rays and, radi and radium to, to treat cancers. Uh, and, uh, but some of the women were pregnant, and so they, they actually discovered first that, that, that these children of these women were much more likely to show microencephaly, smaller brains, uh, and, and developmental problems also discovered in the atomic bomb survivors. So we started looking at the birds. And, and, and sure enough, uh, birds from the more radioactive area had about 5% smaller brains. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it turns out that a, small, a, a bird with 5% smaller brain has about a 50% lower chance of surviving from one year to the next, again suggesting that there are cognitive consequences of this uh, this, this effect. Again, not particularly surprising given what we've known of radiation effects from the medical literature, but again, surprising that we hadn't done any this kind of research in Chernobyl. The rodents show the same kind of effect in both Chernobyl and in Fukushima. Smaller brains in the more radioactive areas. Essentially, uh, you know, everything we look at, sometimes the insects are, are, are a fun tool to, to, to use because they're they're easy to catch, and they, they often have interesting patterns on their bodies, like this firebug. Uh, do, you, do you guys have firebugs here? No? No, no they're really cool. Um, they're, they, they're, they're an invasive species, so undoubtedly you'll get them soon enough. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, they're, they're a really cool tool because, can you see this face mask kind of motif? <laughs> I'll block that out there. See that? 
Well, we, we were walking around Pripyat. This, this is this town just outside the, the, near the reactor that was built to house the engineers at Chernobyl. Uh, walking through Pripyat one day, and uh, actually we were collecting flowers for pollen, and, and, and my colleague, uh, Anders, looked down the ground, and there was one of these firebugs. And he pulls it up and he goes, Tim, look, this one's missing an eye. And I said, well, you know, sure enough. And, and so we started collecting them. And in that one day, we collected a whole bunch. I, I put a few postcards out in the lobby if any of you want this picture. And of course, we have it on the website if you want it. I, I thought it was just remarkable, uh, just uh, you know, how easy it was to capture the impact of, of radiation on development using this kind of a model. And, and somebody just get up, you know, if I need to get off the stage, just tell me and uh, <laughs> I'll wrap it up. Because we do want to have time for discussion. Most of you, if you're following this discussion in, in Fukushima, then you've heard about the pale blue grass butterfly stories, right? How many of you have heard about that? Well, not so many. Okay. Well, uh, there's not as many affectionados as I thought there'd be here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the pale blue grass butterfly story uh, was really interesting. Uh, a Japanese scientist started, had been collecting them anyway as a part of a, a study of climate change and of other environmental effects and just by chance happened to be there <laughs> collecting around the time of Fukushima and sure enough uh, showed that the, uh, there were large impacts on the morphology of the butterfly wings as a result of of the radiation. There were also cumulative effects that were passed down from one generation to the next. We also started seeing things, strange growth forms in the trees. These are pine trees from Chernobyl. Uh, again, very, very strange growth forms. Um, strange color changes. If, if any of you are familiar with the uh, Yablokov book on Chernobyl, you may recognize this from the cover. It's one of my photos. Again, showing changes in the color and quality of the wood. Uh, again, major impacts. Just this week, a paper published out of Japan showing similar consequences for the fir trees in, in, in around Fukushima in response to the radiation. So bottom line, you know, when, when you start, we know there's lots of mutations, lots of genetic effects. We know there are tons of phenotypic consequences from, from very, very obvious to much more subtle, but, but absolutely no question of consequences, developmental consequences uh, of this added mutational load. But does it matter? Does it really matter in terms of ecology? Uh, does it matter in terms of the abundance and biodiversity of the organisms that are there? And, and that really has been, this has really been the main focus of a lot of our work. Uh, and we've taken kind of a, an unusual approach uh, that, that hasn't really been done before. What we, what we decided to do, because, because we don't know, we didn't know exactly how many critters were there before these disasters, right? You never have baseline data for these disasters. By definition, they're unpredictable. And so, so you have to come up with clever ways to generate predictions about what was there before so that you can compare that to what you see now. And so the way we've gotten at this uh, is to, uh, to do uh, what I call, well, massively replicated biotic inventories, where we go to many, many places count all the critters we, we see at that given location and put that into a giant statistical model. Uh, in Chernobyl, we've gone to uh, Ukraine and Belarus and looked at about 400 different locations uh, a few times. In uh, Fukushima, we've gone to about, we've gone to 400 locations uh, for four years now uh, and, and basically uh, surveyed the range of uh, critters at a range of radioactive contaminant, contamination levels. And, and, and again, we put it into this kind of a model where we have, uh, we have our, our inventories, we have our measures of uh, everything else that's important to the distribution and abundance of an organism, not just radiation. So, you know, bird distribution is determined by a lot of things, not just one thing. So you, if you're going to ask the question about radiation, you have to know uh, the other factors that are also influencing their distribution. Uh, and then you have to have radiation measurements and GIS and some multivariate statistics. And using that, you can predict what should be in a given place in the absence of radiation. And this is what we've done, published a bunch of papers on it. 
including three papers on Fukushima birds just this, this spring. In Chernobyl, basically, abundances during the time period that we looked at it 10 years ago, uh, about one third as many birds as there should be in the more highly contaminated areas, about half as many species. Fukushima, that's the one everybody's interested in. After four years of repeated sampling, this is what we find. Huge impacts, dramatically fewer birds in the areas of high radiation, many uh, dramatically fewer species of birds as well. Do I have two minutes more? Okay. Uh, just two minutes. What I wanted to do was to, sh to, to show you about the sound. A couple of biologists counting birds in the, in the background. All right. This is an area up the road, and this is not a scientific analysis, obviously. <laughs> Sample size is one and both, but it reflects the two graphs I just showed you. This is a uh, spot 15 miles up the road, very high radiation level in Fukushima. And since it was July, I think I'll have to go with Dave Vicente and, and call this a science, a silent summer effect as well. <laughs> you know? uh, it, 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 it's really a dead zone. There are no butterflies, no birds, very few. And it's very, very clearly the result of, of the radioactive contaminants. So what does this all mean? Contrary to those important reports by government agencies, uh, there, there, there's clearly an abundance of information. It's not just our, our data uh, that's showing that there are consequences of the levels of contamination that we see in Fukushima and Chernobyl. In other words, injuries to individuals, population species, and even ecosystem functioning. I didn't have time to talk about today, but, but trust me, uh, we, we've shown some, some interesting effects to decomposition and growth and that kind of thing, productivity. Um, long list of major findings. Again, you can, you can go through them, but essentially mutations, phenotypic effects, reproductive effects, effects on longevity, everything that you would predict that radiation might do, uh, it, it, we can see in, in, in Chernobyl and Fukushima. So what are we gonna do about it? Uh, and, and you know, so we're, we're hoping that, that, that we can mount uh, a, a serious scientific effort to, to document a range of biological consequences, that we can document the, the range of relationships with, with different dose rates uh, for these different organisms. We found tremendous variability among individuals and species in the responses, and some individuals, some species have actually shown adaptive responses, positive responses, evolved adaptive responses. We need to know a lot more about what the constraints are. But this effort, uh, you know, needs to be conducted by independent scientists. Scientists at universities or at research institutions that are not uh, directly part of any governmental agency or uh, any regulatory body. And why does that matter to you? You recognize this? Look at that. It's right there, right on the water. <laughs> I hear there are 20 fault zones surrounding it. And then, of course, the other reason is it's coming. It is coming. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>